Thanks a ton everyone for joining the data analytics webinar by equiscale.com on the 21st of July. Our vision is to help everyone to get insights from the vast amount of data that we all have access to today to improve the state of their cells, their organization or their country. Um, I'm the presenter today. I'm the ex vice president of Citigroup. I'm the CEO of equiscale.com. I'm also the adjunct faculty for analytics at a couple of international universities. I conduct workshops on analytics worldwide. I've got more than 15 years experience at Amazon, G and City Analytics. And here's my LinkedIn profile. I also blog a lot on Quora.com. Now here are some of our international workshops. I think this one here on the left hand side is in Singapore and the one on the right is in Telecom Malaysia. Um, that's in Malaysia. We've trained thousands of professionals globally. So as you can see here, these are some of the companies from which people have joined us and um, joined the webinar. And of course, you'll get a copy of this presentation and the recording, so you do not need to record at your end. But the reason why we're all here today, folks, is the vast amounts of data that is being you know, shared across the internet. So if you look at this, right, we're talking about 277,000 tweets, and we're going to analyze Twitter live today and have a look at any topic that you wish. We're going to analyze it live on Twitter for you today. Um, and if you look at it, it's not just about Twitter. You've got, you've got Pinterest shares, you've got video, you've got emails, Google searches, Facebook shares, just a vast amount of data. And what's been happening for the last three or four years continuously is that data is doubling every two years. So I'm talking about a 200% increase in data every two years, right? Which means the amount of data that we have today in July 2018 is exactly twice the amount of data that was available in July 2016, right? And that's the reason why data science has become one of the most important topics across on the internet. Now, if you look at it, um, you may have all heard of big data. This is something that was being talked about in the past, but now big data has become a lesser trend because the fact is that just about all the data you have out there is big data and the characteristics of big data are huge volume, right? We talked about 2x every two years, huge variety. So images, video, um, you've got velocity, it's coming really, really fast and you've got veracity. Now this is all about the concerns around the fake news that are being shared on the internet and how do you make sure that you verify all of the data that's out there on the internet before you actually begin to assume that it's true, including reviews, right? If you're thinking of transitioning into data science or looking at a career in data science, it's a great idea because it is consistently at world number one or world number two in the hottest skills, no matter which geography you look at. If you're looking at the UK, if you're looking at London, if you're looking at Singapore, the New York, if you're looking at Seattle, it doesn't matter. It's always there in the top five, right? And again, um, to share with all of you, we will be sharing the presentation with all of you in the end of the webinar. The reality is that data folks is the new oil and the new soil that corporations are investing in. And there's a predicted shortage of 190,000 data scientists. Now, you'll wonder that so many people um, that you know, they're actually studying data science. They're either doing an MS in data science or they're getting certified online. But the reason, you know, that the shortage still exists is the quality. The whole challenge is that the amount of quality that you require, right, is not available currently um, on the internet. It's just not there. People are not there. And a lot of that is to do with the practice on, you know, data sets and not just clean data sets, but also dirty data sets, right? And that makes all the difference. And I'll share a blog that went really viral, something that I wrote at the end of this webinar. The first thing I want to ask you is what are the different types of analytics? So now this is the question. This is the point where I want you to type any kind of analytics that you've heard of. Okay. So let me put that in the chat box. Right. I'm going to make this really interactive. Any kind of analytics. Okay. Can you please type it into the chat box? I'm going to wait for some responses here. Right. So we've got NLP churn analytics from Dennis. We've got Accounts, okay, this, I'm assuming this financial analytics, Devang, we've got business, customer, Power BI analytics, market analytics, Excel analytics, right? Prescriptive, customer, Twitter analytics. Okay, there you go, right? Now, I want to simplify this for you, okay? Um, you want to think about it in this way. And of course, I've got descriptive, I've got sales, predictive, high frequency trading, fantastic. Fundamentally, there's only and only three kinds of analytics. And you want to keep this in mind everything else is a subset of these three kinds of analytics. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about descriptive analytics. Now, 
what is descriptive analytics descriptive is all about describing what is going on in the business okay and that is descriptive analytics now when i talk about what's going on in a business at any point in time i'm already talking about something that's happened in the past so that's why what you see here is you see on the left hand side that descriptive analytics is all about hindsight right it's not really about insight as much as it is about hindsight and knowing what happened in the past okay so if we are clear on that the next kind of analytics is why it happened the way it happened so let's take an example to make this a little bit easier right let's suppose that the sales last month went down by 18% as compared to the same quarter last year okay so we call this um, an 18% yoy decline in the sales now if this is what happened the real question is not just what happened but it's also about a simple question that the head of sales is going to ask the person that works on analytics it starts with w it's one word and it's got two more letters in it can you fill this for me come on folks absolutely right so you guys got it it's not just about what happened but why did this happen okay and the moment you try to answer the question why things happened the way they happened you're not talking about the past anymore you're talking about some insight and that's what you see here on the left hand side right so predictive analytics is about predicting why things happened the way they happened not just describing what happened now describing what happened is all about reports it's about drill downs it's about business intelligence maybe you talk about role based metrics like what how are the sales folks doing how's the sales manager sales heads region heads doing you might even have some exceptions and alerts talking about something that happened that's really important for example um if there's a spike or a dip in the sales or if your credit card got swiped right even that counts as descriptive analytics but why things happened the way they happened that is predictive analytics now suppose you predict that the reason that things happened the way they happened were as follows let's say people are waiting okay for the year end sales and let's say um that could be it could be a lot of things it could be the black friday sale if some of you are aware of um black friday we just had a sale day let's say amazon prime and now that's gone by so if prime has gone by and then waiting for the next big sale so basically folks are waiting for the next big sale but that's not enough okay so you come to the third kind of analytics which is equally important as the first two and probably the highest in terms of sophistication sure we now know um you know what happened we know why it happened the next big question is starts with h and again it's just two letters right so how do we get the sales back up again okay and you're absolutely right and the moment you talk about how how do i do this you're actually asking for foresight you're asking for vision into how to proceed into the future now a lot of this today folks needs to be automated you need to have dynamic rules you cannot have human beings manning these e-commerce platforms you need to have machine learning to make sure that you're spending your ads okay if you've got google ads you've got digital marketing ads you need to constantly you know review those ads and optimize those ads and you can't have human beings doing that day and night so we employ a lot of machine learning to do this right and including when you monitor on cctv cameras let me give you another example you've got a cctv camera and you're monitoring folks that are coming across um, in in an airport or in a station continuously you're monitoring it 24/7 to look for insights okay you're not going to have human beings doing this kind of work so there you go you have it right these are the three kinds of analytics descriptive predictive and prescriptive now let's understand if these are the three kinds of analytics then what is financial analytics and if you ever thought about that Or, or let's say, what is HR analytics? Or what is big data analytics? Okay, and I'm sure you've got some of these questions going on in your mind, right? So these are nothing but applications. So when you apply any of these, okay, types of analytics to finance data, right, then it becomes uh, financial analytics. If you apply any of these to HR data or organizational data, it becomes HR analytics, right? if you apply it to big data well you know what what to do right it's really easy now it's big data analytics right so these are just applications they're not really different kinds of analytics now what does a data analyst do versus a data scientist versus an ml engineer if you understand these are not watertight compartments so the first myth that i want to blast here right away is a lot of people think that these are watertight 
okay so if i you know get to be a data analyst then i'm going to do something i'm going to be doing something really different from what a data scientist does and that's probably a lot cooler and then finally if i work on ml or ai that's got to be super cool isn't it so that's what that's the way the conventional wisdom or thinking goes but it is actually not watertight at all so let me just clarify that before i move anywhere else this is not true so the way it works is there are overlaps and if you look at it this is what a data analyst does his work or her work spans all the way up from pulling data from the data sources now below here you've got databases like for perhaps um, sql server right or you've got databases like amazon redshift you've probably got cloud data sources as well so i'm going to put here amzn so you know this is amazon and then you've got cloud data sources like azure the google cloud so i'm just going to draw a little cloud here so you know this is a cloud right now pulling all of this data cleaning it and making very meaningful reports to the leadership understand folks this is 70 percent of the industry 70 percent of the jobs globally are all about this right data analysis now these days you don't do data analysis only in excel um, you used a lot of sophisticated softwares right you would probably use uh, bi tools like tableau all right you might use uh, tools like power bi okay these are the top two tools and i will talk about them in a very short while and of course you might use excel but you would also have to know a little bit of sql to query that data and finally you would use r or Python just a little bit, okay, to do some univariate or multivariate analysis, and I'll come to that in a very short while. Now then, what does a data scientist do? A data scientist, well, their work spans, again, they also have to do some descriptive analytics, so it's not all predictive, so please do understand that there is a significant overlap between what a data scientist and a data analyst does. So it's a progression, it's a career progression when people move up from one role to another. And then when you move up again, uh, you know, people focus a lot on automating things and how the business works. And that is what ML or AI engineers do, right? And again, you'll see that there's a significant amount of overlap. I just want to talk about this a little bit, right? The logic or the algorithms that get built and encoded into the system and put into production into Uber or Amazon or Flipkart or LinkedIn, <coughs> the recommendations that you get on friends, connections are all a result of some predictive analytics that a data scientist has done, right? These are all the result of some kind of predictions that have been put into action by an ML or an AI engineer, right? Again, so you notice that there are significant overlaps and that's something I've tried to sort of bring to all of your notice over here, right? And we'll move ahead now. Very quickly, if you look at the applications of analytics, every industry out there, starting from retail to financial and healthcare, e-commerce, um, you've got healthcare here, you've got financial here, you've got telecom, and then social media, right? Everyone is using analytics, and I'll give you some examples of how it's being used in different industries. Let's take some really popular examples, right? So if you need to sort of segment your customers, okay, how do you actually build those segments? So if, if Amex needs to decide which customer to offer um, a silver credit card which customer to offer a gold credit card and which you know, customer to offer the Amazon, uh, the Amex uh, Platinum credit card. How do you actually arrive at this? Now, one of the ways you could do this is by using rules. For example, saying that, well, you know what? There are some values that you have to achieve. For example, if you want to use silver, then we're looking at a minimum spend of 3000 US dollars, 3K US dollars. Gold is, let's say, 5K US dollars. Okay, but these kind of rules do not stand the test of time because the economy changes from time to time. The best way to do customer segmentation is to use an algorithm called K-means clustering. And I'm gonna just talk about this here. Don't worry about it, nice and easy. K-means is actually an unsupervised machine learning algorithm. And I'll talk about what unsupervised means in a very short while. Um, it basically learns itself what are the different kinds of customer segments from the data. You do not have to teach that algorithm. That's an unsupervised algorithm where you do not have to tell it which customers belong to which bracket and yet it understands. But then again, there are supervised algorithms as well. And let's talk about those. So what are supervised algorithms? Those are the algorithms where you actually tell the computer a pattern and then it understands that pattern and 
applies that pattern to different sets of data and makes predictions. So, for example, if I've got transaction number one, I've got transaction number two, um, I've got transaction number three, and transaction number four, I'm just simplifying this for you. I actually label this data, and I say that this is fraud. Um, this one, I say it's actually okay, right? And I add labels to all of these transactions. This one, I say it's okay. And the fourth one, I say it's fraud. Now, the computer actually learns from the labels that I've provided it, and it sort of tries to understand, oh, okay, is there a pattern in these transactions? There's the date, the time on which the transaction happened, the person that actually did the transaction, the social security number, the credit limits. It tries to understand all of that and predict why the fraud happened and which one of these variables, for example, variable one, variable two, variable three, variable four and five, which one of these are actually predicting a fraudulent transaction. Now, given that, if I give that more transactions, if I give it transaction number five and transaction number six, it's able to learn. And this process is known as supervised machine learning. And it learns and it says, well, you know what? I think transaction number five is probably okay. And I'm around 82% confident that the transaction is okay. And that's a probability. But I do think that transaction number three could probably be fraudulent. And we are 75% confident that this transaction is fraudulent. Now you've understood supervised and unsupervised machine learning and how they work across different platforms. But not just that, when you look at recommendation engines, so every day, Facebook probably asks you to add 20 people to your friends list, right? And LinkedIn wants you to add 30 new connections. Now, where's all this coming from? Well, this is coming from the fact that there's a statistical technique called market basket analysis, which is used to build a recommendation engine. And they're able to figure out using the friends that you already have. And let's say you have 189 friends on Facebook and that's not a lot of friends. These days people have 500. It's able to figure out which next 20 people would you be likely to add as a friend on the basis of a lot of different attributes. So as you can see here, these are all data science algorithms that get used in all of these industries, okay? And um, um, I am recording this session again, just for the benefit of some people who are asking questions. All of you will receive the recordings. What I want you to do, okay? And this is, you know, consider this an assignment or a homework is, I want you to go and understand uh, how sales forecasting is done by using an algorithm called linear regression. And I'm going to give you a very nice article. Um, in fact, I'll ask me admin team here, Pallab, right, to share the blog on uh, linear regression. We've got two blogs on linear regression, which I want you to study. Again, linear regression is also supervised, right? And I want you to figure out how it's used for sales forecasting. Okay. Um, we are going to be uploading this on YouTube, my friend Hakim, and you will get it, all right? Don't you worry about that, all right? All right, and all of you will be getting the video and the presentation, so please focus on the learning here, not on collecting the video and the presentation. Trust me, what you learn here in this session will be far more useful uh, than watching the video, which you will not have time for later, all right? Okay, so I want you to know, folks, next, which industries are the big ones in terms of using analytics, okay? So number one, believe it or not, is actually telecom, right? So your AT&Ts, your Verizons, your Airtel, your Geo, these guys are the number one globally, all right? Or if you're in the UK, then Libara, okay? These are the number one globally in using analytics. Now, who's number two? Number two is actually the banks. There we go. So I've got this here for you. You want to focus on some of these industries. Which ones are the upcoming industries? So healthcare, definitely the number one in terms of the upcoming industries where analytics and data science are being used. A huge, huge amount of opportunities popping up in the healthcare space for analytics, right? All right, so all of you, you'll all notice that we've just shared a blog on linear regression. I want you to go and understand how sales can be forecasted by using linear regression by uh, using this particular blog. And Anthony, if you didn't notice, then over here, social media is already uh, mentioned over here, but surprisingly, they're not, you know, in terms of volume, in terms of the number of jobs, social um, and professional networking is not where analytics is being used um, the maximum, right? It's a surprising trend. Now look at banks today, the, you know, the pressure on banks is to have zero branches. Can you believe that? So, you know, there are banks in Europe that have zero branches. And if you can find out the name of the bank, uh, I'm going to clap for you in the class, okay? 
but if you look at it the challengers right for banks they are not other banks okay the challengers for banks are the disruptors the guys who are doing the analytics on the footfall and finding ways to do debranching so let me talk about this here i'll just circle this for you reduce the number of branches and move things to the omni channel right and debanking just reduce the amount of banking itself no one wants to go to a bank anymore so you innovate or you die right and something that you now you want to go and read about is called omni channel banking okay now you know it okay but let me just put it here for everybody as well the whole idea is that why can't we just you know use a different method of banking completely from what we do today for example can we bank on chat and all of you know that wechat is already being used in indonesia malaysia and china to make payments you've all heard of paytm the billion dollar company in india you all know about that you certainly know about paypal right the whole idea is these are internet based chat, you know um banking softwares and you have banking over chat you have banking over voice uh, you have banking over ivr and very shortly you will have banking over bots so you're going to have a bot an ai based bot that's going to chat with you and serve you um, your banking needs right so the question is forget about why do you need a bank okay the question is why do you even need a bank teller okay or why do you need an accountant and i'm sorry if there's some accountants here right how do you solve this problem you solve this problem by learning to automate what you do and you do that with data science right okay and i know you guys are beginners and you've come to the right place this is the absolutely right presentation but it's not just the banks even functions like human resources that were never using analytics in the past in 2013 the corporate executive board in the us said that 82% of business leaders did not trust the hr data and that sort of spurred hr into action when they uh, got this survey result from around 1258 ceos and the orange colors here you know show you the unhappy ceos right so these are the ceos saying that they are not happy with the amount of data that they're getting from the hr function and that's not cool right so that's spun them into action i think that's changed and now by 2018 you will see that there's a lot of jobs out there for folks in hr and data science now vivek talks about the fact that the irony is if the same consumer becomes jobless who will use these products actually there is no irony so when the industrial revolution came we all thought that jobs would be lost but new jobs got created for the new technologies right so it's not like all of this is going to come and automate the whole world in a flash and by the way there are something called assumptions in the world of analytics and data science so you assume that people need to work human beings may have a totally different purpose to life than to just work in the future all right so just watch which way it's going okay? it'll be really interesting what skills do you need is really important and you need three skills right so one is your business skills and that's what you see on top right and then on the left you've got bottom left you've got your it skills and that's number 2 and then third and finally um you've got your data science skills that's skill number 3 at the intersection of all of these is a data scientist and that's why it's so hard to find one because all of us have one or the other skills we probably have certain amount of technology skills or we know a <clears throat> little bit of statistics but we don't know a lot about hedge funds or you know a lot about hedge funds and finance but you really cannot go beyond excel right so this combination of these three skill sets is really what makes a data scientist okay this is what you need to acquire so you have to figure out what you're missing right now and add that to your skill set and this is by gartner the leading body of research on data science now the question is which software shall i use now i keep saying this on a lot of different forums and i do not mean any disrespect folks whatsoever right but tools tools are for fools right so if you just focus on the tools the tools going to change and you're going to be out of a job so it's really important that you understand that it is not a battle here right and people you know believe that this is a battle of r versus python a lot of people who do not have experience they led to believe that this is what it is because there's a lot of freshers talking about these rumors right or they say it's tableau um versus um power bi for example right now i'd say it's not one versus the other it's a combination of both so if you're really in data science you should be equally good at different tools you should be able to adapt right now which tools are popular is something that's interesting to know so if i was you in data science today i would for sure train myself on tableau and power bi right this would be for the bi piece 
or the descriptive analytics. Let me just put this here, okay? Now, what we're not seeing in this graph and what is an absolutely given, okay, is that you should be superb at Excel and superb at SQL. Now, nobody talks about this. These are just given. So if you are not, you need to start there, okay? That's number one. Another given is that you have an understanding of statistics. Again, nobody talks about it, but if you do not know descriptive and inferential statistics, you're gone, okay? It doesn't go anywhere beyond um, that particular point. But assuming that you know these things, right, where you need to then begin your journey is to learn Tableau and Power BI, all right? And moving beyond that, we need to go back to the predictive part of the analytics. For the predictive part of the analytics, the most popular tools are R and Python. Both of these are open source tools. If you ask me, I think R does a great job of exploring your data. So the detective work is very intelligent. It's got fantastic statistical software. It's cunning. It's, you can you know, write in you know, just, you know, let's say five to 10 lines of code in R. You can achieve what you'd need to write at least 20 to 30 lines of code in Python, right? So it's really, really cunning, short cryptic codes, but for the same reason, it can be a little difficult to understand initially, okay? Um, it has more brain than it has raw computing power. So think of it as Batman, right? That's the right superhero. And by the way, um, I've never had heard someone say, you know, for example, um, who's the better superhero? Is it Batman or Superman? You guys go and watch both the movies, isn't it? Right? So. Absolutely, thanks a lot. There are more comparisons like TensorFlow versus Keras and Shiny is good for descriptive dashboarding. Sure, Shiny is a nice package as well, right? All right, there you go. So be sure to understand that another thing that's really important for you to understand is that you do not decide, okay, which tool is going to be used, right? It's not about you, all right? Let's be really clear because if you're going to be using Power BI, there are certain combinations that are fairly popular out there. For example, if you are working with a client that has Power BI, then R works really, really well with Power BI because Microsoft has um, released a version of R called Microsoft R, right? If you're working on Tableau, you can work with R as well, okay? And if you're working on Python as well, you could, you could also do Tableau with Python, right? That's called TabPy. There are integrations available. Um, and this one here is called TabPy. Okay, so you don't get to decide. It's the client that decides. You don't even get to decide whether you're going to work on a local computer or if you're going to work on the cloud, right? And you don't get to decide what database you're going to use. So if someone's already using Amazon Redshift, they're not gonna to move to SQL Server for you, right? So get used to the fact that tools are not important per se, but if you do need to pick up the right tools, then these are the ones that you need to pick up right now. I would not say any one of these is more important than the other. R is still around 47% of the market. Uh, Python is around 52% of the market. Um, Tableau and Power BI, roughly half and half. So pick up all of these along with Excel and SQL, and then you're okay, right? Cloud is important. Now, once you complete this course, the Analytics Accelerator Certification, right, if you look at it, um, the course, you know, it sort of takes you through all of these things. So let me show you here on equiscale.com. We have the data analytics accelerator starting next Sunday. You're all invited to the next class free of cost, right? So you can all join. Now you'll notice here that it focuses on a lot of tools, you know, like R, Excel, Tableau, Power BI. Um, you learn descriptive and inferential statistics before you go on to Tableau, visual analytics. You go on to advanced um, data wrangling in Excel and Power BI. And then you start off with your predictive or machine learning algorithms. You get introduced to R, you get to work on linear regression, logistic regression, and linear regression is what you use for sales forecasting. Logistic regression is what you use for risk modeling, clustering and segmentation of customers, recommendation engines using market basket analysis, managing text and customer reviews on websites using text mining and decision trees, sentiment analysis, and then finally advanced techniques like RFM, and cohorts for websites and a capstone project, right? To finish it all off. So that's kind of like the flow that you would expect for a good data science program. I'm just gonna share this program for you. Let me just share the link over here. ClickView is a very good software. I got a question on ClickView. So we're actually working on a project right now. So apart from, um, apart from actually doing EdTech, we also consult 
And what you'll notice is up here, right? You'll notice that just after Tableau and Python, the distance has widened, okay? But still, in the leaders in 2018, you still have ClickView, okay? So it would be at a number three. I think Tableau and Power BI would be at a joint number one, right, for right now. That's where the traction is. But you can expect to work on ClickView because I'm working on it myself right now. Now, here's your certification. This goes on your LinkedIn page. It comes as a live link which gets shared um, globally. And we'll share tips on how to build your resume, how to make yourself popular on LinkedIn as a data scientist with all of you. The folks that join today, they will get a discount, right? So all of you, you'll notice that it's um, uh, on the website, the listed price is 18,900 Indian rupees, which is US dollars around 289. But for you today, um, those of you who have joined, we're really thankful for your participation. It's just 17,900. It's in this presentation only. It's not on the internet and it's US dollars 269. For our friends in Indonesia, London and the US, we've got a lot of international learners. So we conduct our classes at exactly the same time that you joined today, okay? at exactly the same time and the class goes for three hours, right? I've got some of all of these links over here for you to actually go through to just sort of give you a hint. Um, I just wanted to share a couple of important links with you. Just give me a second here while I pull them up. Okay, here we go. So first up, you'll notice that I blog a lot on Quora.com and this is my profile here on Quora. I'm just gonna share it across with you. I answer a lot of questions on Quora and um, here's my profile. Please feel free to follow me. On analytics specifically, if you go to the most viewed writers globally, you'll see that you know we're typically in the top five somewhere globally on analytics. So these are the world rankings. So please do feel free to join me on Quora and um, you know go through all the live answers that I give on Quora. You'll also see that we rated 4.9 out of five on Facebook. So here's our Facebook page. All of the free events that we organize are advertised on our Facebook page. So please do go and like the Facebook page. So you keep getting invites to more exciting webinars like this, okay? So here we go, that's the Facebook page. All right, fantastic, it's time for the demos. So we're going to demo quite a few things. Let's start off with Tableau, right? And I'm sure a lot of you are excited about Tableau, right? The average salary for folks that work on Tableau is around $110,000. Um, in Australia and upwards of $90,000 US as well. Um, in India, uh, anywhere around 10 lakhs or above is the wages that you get if you work on Tableau, right? So definitely uh, one of the big tools that you want to pick up over a period of time. What we're going to do is we're actually going to give you a quick demo of Tableau using the global superstore data set. And I'm going to open the data set here, make you all comfortable in Tableau. <clears throat> And here we go, here's the global superstore data set. What you'll notice is the very first window that I connected to, I, well, I connected to an Excel file, right? And you notice that it's got three tabs on it. It's got some orders, it's got people who place the orders, it's got some returns. And you'll see how ridiculously easy it is to work on Tableau. So I'll take all of the orders, I'll take the order table and come and drop it over here. All right, there you go. And Tableau starts processing the orders table, okay? And then you see all of the orders. Now, very quickly, you know, what you notice is that Tableau labels things for you. So you know that this year is a number, right? You know over here that this year is a text, all right? And you can see over here that this year is date and time. So it's a date and time variable. This year is a geographical variable. It's also known as a geospatial variable. So Tableau gives you visual cues of the kind of variable, right? And this is a CSV data file, absolutely. You can connect live to the data source like a database or you can extract the data and work on it. And live you could connect to any data source globally, right? So if you look at it, you know, if I open a new file here just for a second, right? You'll notice that you could work on Amazon Redshift. You could um, work on a ton of softwares um, and ton of databases, right? All of that is absolutely possible in Tableau. But how do you actually work on Tableau, okay? Let's understand that. So the first thing that you need to understand is that there's a difference between data visualization and data visual analytics, okay? So let me just, you know, first take you through that difference very quickly so all of you understand the difference between data visualization and visual analytics, okay? 
So here's a quick presentation that I want to just take you through a couple of slides, okay, for a very important introduction. See, what tends to happen, folks, is that we believe that any graph or chart that we make is visual analytics, but it is not. Okay, the question is, what is a real visual analytics? And if you believe that graphs or charts like these are visual analytics, you are mistaken. Okay, this is just, um, you know, a representation of some findings, right? And hold your questions. I'm going to answer all your questions at the end of the webinar. You can get Tableau public free of cost lifetime to practice and I'll give you the link. Okay, but understand what I'm sharing here. Okay, see visual analytics is not thinking, working on Excel and then making some graphs. Oh no, it is not, right? So it is not any graph or any chart or any dashboard that just shows you the conclusions. It is about exploring the data visually, not using SQL, not using spreadsheets, okay? So what are we not going to use? We're not going to use Excel to explore this data. We're not going to use um, SQL to query this data. We're going to query it visually we're going to analyze it visually, including the formulas. So all of that is going to happen visually. But the question you'll ask me is, hey, why? When we've got all of these fantastic, you know, softwares, Python, R, why do visuals? Well, the first reason is that you are far more likely to like breakfast on the right hand side than you are to like breakfast on the left hand side, right? Human beings are visual creatures. You're far more likely to understand the number of injuries on the football player here. And if I ask you, where are the maximum injuries? Can you all tell me the part of the body where are the maximum injuries in the chat box, please? Come on, everybody. Absolutely, right? So you guys got it. It's the knee, right? Followed by the ankle. And this becomes so apparent because you're able to comprehend it visually. So what are the essential characteristics of visual analytics? The most important one is explore the data visually. Okay, move from one view to another and link all of those views, collaborate as you work on the data. If you do these four things, then what you're doing is visual analytics. But if you're somewhere in the corner, right, and you're analyzing stuff and just visualizing it, that's just data visualization, okay? So I've got some comments in the chat box around Seaborn. Seaborn in Python is advanced, but it's nowhere, nowhere as close as, Py as uh, Tableau, my friend. Nowhere, okay? Let's be clear about that. So let me ask you here, how many nines do you see? Okay, and please understand the technology is different from analytics, right? So tell me how many nines do you see on the screen over here? Hard, isn't it? I'm not getting any answers, so let me make it different. Now, now can you tell me, count and tell me how many nines? Come on folks, nice and easy. Absolutely, right? So you all got it. So why did you get it? And why are we putting so much pressure on other human beings to understand numbers while we're actually strong at visuals? So visual analytics is about representing and presenting data in such a way that exploits our human visual perception abilities to amplify our cognition or understanding. A lot of the times you get data sets like this one over here. You've got data set one, two, three, and four. You think that these data sets, you know, are best analyzed by using statistical features like, you know, Python or R. And you do this analysis only to be disappointed because the mean is exactly the same. So is the variance, so is the mean of X and Y, so is the correlation, shows the linear regression. Exactly the same for all of these four data sets. And you think they're identical till you visualize them. And then you realize, oh my God, these are absolutely different, right? The first one has a clear cut trend, a line of best fit. The second one is parabolic. The third one, you know, it has a linear, a strong linear relationship, but it's a negative relationship. It's actually beginning to, you know, dip. It's a positive relationship, but it's beginning to dip and there's an outlier here. Um, in the fourth data set, there's absolutely no relationship between X and Y, for example, sales and profit, and you have an outlier. So my point is that it's not just about analytics. Analytics will take you till here, but this is not the starting point. A lot of people use the methodology called DECOVA. I want you to go and research on DECOVA and in the DECOVA methodology, right? The discovery phase employs a lot of visualization, okay? All right, so we'll go back to Tableau, enough talk, and let's go and work on our data set. Look at how easy it is to split the data in Tableau, right? So I'll just click here and I'll split, kaboom. Okay, and there you go. Your data gets split into three different parts. I can remove the couple of splits that I no need, by the way, because I have the original field. 
and the third split, these are really the distribution centers, so I can rename them the distribution centers here, right? Okay. And that's it, I'm ready to play with the data. By the way, if you um, are used to creating joins, okay, <coughs> in Tableau, um, you can do joins really, really easy. All right, what you can do is just drop any other table and you can do the joins, right? And Ravindra, what I would suggest for you, if you're not able to see, see the screen is please log out and log in again and it'll work for you. So I'm going to drop the returns table. So you have orders and you have returns. And the moment I drop returns, you'll notice that there's a join, right? There's a field that's common between these two tables is called the market. And I can easily change to different kind of joins. For example, if I want all the data from the orders table and the matching data or the common data between orders and returns, I can choose the left join. If I want all the data from the returns table and I want the matching records from the orders and returns table, I can use the right join. If I want all the data, I don't quite care whether it's in the orders that were placed by customers or whether it's in returns, I can use a full outer join, right? So that becomes a one click exercise, all right? And will you guys please relax? I'm gonna give you all a Tableau public free edition at the end of this class. Just hang around, okay? Now notice that the way I work in Tableau is I go and click on sheet number one and boom, I'm ready to work. And what's going to happen is I'm going to create visualizations and I'm going to move from one visualization to another visualization right and i'm going to explore the data visually right here in front of you behind those visualizations are sql queries so there's query number one there's query number two there's query number three and you don't get to see these queries these queries are happening in the background while you work on the data in the foreground right okay this is two and three sorry for the typos and then there are also tables getting created which you can access access if you need so think of it as table number one, which is a result of query one, table number two, table number three, there are calculations that are happening. Everything's happening in the background. All you get to see in Tableau is the cool stuff, which is the visualizations, which give you your inferences. So let's start working, okay? My first question, okay? And here I'm just gonna type out the question for you really quick, okay? The question is, how are we doing in different countries or let's say different geographies in terms of the quantity that's sold for different categories, right? There you go. So if that's the question, right? Or let's say for different customer segments, if that's the question, how do we answer this question in Tableau? Now we'd answer this question and sorry for the typo in Excel or in Python by using descriptive statistics, but let's see how we answer it here. So all I do is I choose market, I click on market, I click on category. I'd like to know how I'm doing in different markets, in different categories, um, in different product segments. So I go and find segments, I click on segments as well. So I've got products, categories, market and segments selected and I click quantity as well. Notice quantity comes in green color because it's a measure. So things like discount, profit, sales, shipping cost, which are things which we measure on a daily basis to look at the health of the business. Those are known as measures and they come on the bottom left corner in Tableau. But the things that you don't measure, for example, the name of the customer or where your customers live, you don't quite care where they, uh, where they live or you don't want to ask a customer to change their name, right? So those things are dimensions. They used to split your data and they're on the top left corner in Tableau. All right. So once you've selected all of the variables of interest, all you do is go to show me and it recommends a bar graph to you over here, right? You can select this bar graph auto recommended. You can select the tree map. You can select this horizontal bar here and I'll pick the horizontal bar because we all read from left to right. It's really easy for us to read from left to right. The only problem is I noticed that there's some scrolling involved here, which is not nice. So what I'll do is I'll just take this market and I'll drop it here on top in the columns. So instead of market being in the rows, it'll come into the columns and now it's really easy to understand, right? And you can look at which markets are performing well across different countries um, in the world, right? So this is, you know, one way of doing it. The other is you can take markets and drop it on color and make this really, really visual, right? And make it fit the whole width and move to presentation mode right here in Tableau and look at your leading market spaces. And this is how you work in Tableau. Right? You work in terms of drag and drops and you can do a lot more. So suppose now my second question and I'll call this view here, I'll rename the sales across markets. 
and if I want to look at the data behind this, all I need to do is right click and view the data. I can copy my data. I can export this data here as a CSV file, right? And I can open it up in Tableau for this particular view. Now, if you actually have a look at this data, you'll notice that the quantity has already been populated for you over here, all right? So what I'm going to do though, is I'm going to go back um, a little bit and I'm going to remove the joins right now, okay? So what we'll do is we'll remove the joins so that we work without the joins, all right? So we've done the outer join here. So let me just do that here for a second. All right, and while we're opening up Tableau again, I'll just give you all the link to get Tableau free of cost. It's called Tableau Public. There you go. If you're a student, you can get the Tableau student version. So here we go. This is Tableau Public. And I'm going to put this in the presentation. So all of you can actually take it from the presentation that I'll email to you. All right, so there you go. Tableau Public. All right, that's included in the presentation for you now. All right. Oh, one thing I forgot to show you all of the data sources that Tableau can access and have a look here, right? You can see that the whole, all databases in the whole world, right, are available for you here in Tableau, okay? So I've worked in Power BI. One of the questions I got is it's very similar to Power BI. I would say Tableau is any day more sophisticated than Power BI. I train people on Power BI in universities across the world. <coughs> Power BI is beginning to get there, definitely. Power BI has very good ETL and data manipulation and querying ability, right? While Tableau is a master at visually exploring your data. And that to me would be the key difference between Tableau and Power BI. But Tableau is trying to get there, okay? They're trying to work on their you know, capabilities uh, and you'll see that they'll get much better over a period of time. All right, so I'll show you another way to arrive at the same view. I'll click on category, market, and segment and quantity right and I'll double click here I'll drop market on color and that's it kaboom we've got our first view and this next question is which countries am I making profits in which countries am I making losses in right and this is super easy to do so if I rename this view here sales by region sales by country is super easy to do I pick country I pick sales and I go to show me and I click on the world map there you go and immediately I get the sales across all different countries in the world. If I want to break this up by state, right away I can just drop state on the map. There you go. And the moment I do that, I get sales in each and every state. But that's not enough. I'm not just worried about sales. I'm also working, worried about profit, isn't it? So I take profit, I drop it on top of color. And now I can see where I'm making losses and profits. I can edit my colors and go for simple, easy to understand colors like red for loss, and green for profits. And I get a view of global sales and profits. Not only that, I can increase the size of my view so I can really understand um, you know, the profits better and reduce the opacity a little bit there. Okay, add a border. And it's a really nice view of global sales and profits that I get over here, right? Now, what I can do to this is I can zoom into any geography. For example, if I want to go to Indonesia, right? I just click here, I type Indonesia, and it takes me to Indonesia despite my typing mistake. I can increase the size of my bubbles and look at the profitability in Indonesia. I noticed that um, Riau is the only place that is not making profits in Indonesia, right? But the rest of Indonesia is profitable. And then we've also got here, you know, uh, Tengara Bharat where we're making losses. Okay, so that becomes really easy and I can unpin this view. Uh, you'll notice that this is a total mess because I've increased the size of the bubbles. No worries, just bring it back down. That easy. And if I want to understand how we're doing across all different segments, you know, the product segments, so I can just right click and I can add that as a filter. And on the top right corner, you can notice a filter there, okay? And then over here, what you'll notice is you can make this interactive and embed this into a word web page. So I can add a single values list like so. I can remove unnecessary information like so, go to the maximum view and I can go and embed this on my website, right? I could even give this a name. So let me just call this global sales and profits. Okay, there you go. So this is, you know, how Tableau works, but it's not just about visualization. So if you'll notice, watch carefully. As I move, um, you know, to corporate and home office, I notice some trends, right? 
Now, instead of this particular, you know, segment, what I could also do is I'm just going to drop segment out. I'm going to take the product category instead. I'll add that as a filter. Um, and I'll take all the product categories and I'll actually make this filter visible. So I'll show the filter. And when you look at the different product categories across the world, you'll clearly see that furniture is making a lot of losses, all right? Across the world, Southeast Asia, uh, the Middle East, but technology is not so bad. Look at Texas, for example. Um, it's actually not making losses for technology, but when you look at furniture, Texas is making huge losses and so is Florida. Um, so is a lot of a lot of different states in Indonesia. You can see Jakarta, you can see Malaysia, Thailand. The question is, what's wrong with technology? Why are the profits low? Could it be the shipping cost? Let's find out because furniture items are really heavy. Could it be the shipping cost that's dragging down the profits? And the way you do this is super easy. You can run a linear regression algorithm in Python. Okay, <clears throat> just give me a second here. I'll answer your questions, Prashant. Please hold on. Q and A is at the end of the class, okay? I'll answer all your questions, okay? Now I'm trying to predict if shipping cost is leading to the lack of profits. So how do I do that? All I do is I take shipping cost and I drop it on the column. I take the profits and I drop it on the rows. One single point showing total shipping cost, total profit. But I want to see this for every market. So I drop market on the shapes. Now I get a different shape for each market, US, LATAM, EMEA, Africa, right? And the total uh, shipping cost, total profit. I want to see this for all categories. I'm concerned about furniture. So what I can do is I can drop category on top of color. Now different colored triangle for each category, furniture, office supplies, technology, in each geography. But I want to see this for all my customers, right? So I'll take customers and drop it on detail. Now this is all my customers across the world. I can disaggregate this data. So I see just the shipping cost and profit per customer. Clearly, I can see that a lot of transactions are below the line of profitability. So if this is the line of profitability, which is zero profit, you can see all of these transactions below the line of profitability. The question is why so? And this is where you can move to predictive analytics in Tableau, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to move to analytics pane over here. Let me just show you where. Over here, the analytics pane, and we're going to build a model, right? We're going to build a predictive model to look at whether shipping cost is what is impacting our profits. So what I do is, again, um, I take a trend line and I drag it and drop it on linear regression trend model. I gave you a blog to read on our website, by the way. So all of you want to go to equiskill.com and in free tutorials, you want to go and read about there's some really nice tutorials like the word cloud for moto g6 and the sentiment analysis but there's a nice one on introduction to linear regression right you want to read through that blog to understand what i'm about to do now see i've dragged and dropped the linear regression trend line and i get these three lines over here right and let me just put put this here and let me just call this the profit model okay so i'll call it the profit model there we go it's really profit versus shipping cost. And what you'll notice is that here's the equation. Notice this equation, and I'm just gonna take this as a screenshot here and talk about this equation a little bit. See the blue line is furniture and furniture profits are declining. And this is the equation or the model that we get, right? Now, by the way, you'd have to write a lot of lines of code to get this in R and Tableau, but we've, uh, in R and Python, but we've managed to do it right here without any lines of code. Um, what we're gonna do is very quickly, look at this equation and talk about this equation. Would all of you be able to give me just 15 minutes extra? If you can give me 15 minutes extra, I'm gonna teach you the basics of linear regression right away. But if you're short on time, let me know, okay? Because we've got an R, R demo coming up in a very short while. Okay, there you go, all right guys. Guys, really easy, okay? Really, really easy. You've all learned this in school. There's an equation called Y is equal to m x plus c okay now if you're in indonesia or jakarta then you've probably heard the same thing okay but you know it might have been y is equal to a x plus b so different countries you know they teach it differently in the schools okay so my friends in indonesia will all agree with me that they have been um, seeing this and thanks a lot mohit tuli if you're short of time please fill the feedback form so that you get the recording and the presentation. Um, Palab, can you please share the feedback form? Those who are leaving, make sure you fill up the feedback form. I respect your privacy. I'll, I'll be sure that all of you get 
the presentation the recording and the data and the tableau installation link okay here we go guys so profit is nothing but why it is known as the dependent variable because it depends on shipping cost which is x which is known as the independent variable but how does y depend on x it depends on x using the equation y or shipping cost uh, i'm sorry profit is equal to 0.69 okay multiplied by shipping cost and this has been computed by tableau minus 14.54 and that's the equation now my you know dilemma here when i look at this equation is so what is this important or is this not important because my business leader is asking me are our profits down due to shipping costs and i don't know whether to say yes or no um, just by basis of looking at this equation so the things that you need to look at are the p value and the r squared value and i'll just talk about them very briefly here let me first talk about the p value the p value is the error value okay and if the error is low then the prediction or the relationship is strong all right so let me put this um, like this if p value okay is low then the relationship is <clears throat> is a strong relation ship okay so clearly uh, what you'll notice is that the p value here is really really low it is just 0.001 which means that the accuracy of this prediction is 1 minus the error which is 0 0.001 multiplied by 100 and i think a lot of you folks here are beginning to understand that this is basically almost a 99.99% um, established fact that there is a relationship between shipping cost and profit so we are sure we are sure to the extent of 99.99 percent how sure should you be well at least you know the p-value should be 0 0.05 or less now you see if the p-value is 0 0.05 or less it means that the confidence that you have is 1 minus 0 0.05 multiplied by 100 which is 95 percent confidence in the industry if you're 95 percent confident that's considered great okay and if the p-value is less than 9.05 then your confidence level is actually going to be more than 0.05 isn't it okay that depends okay the only thing i want you to know is in the case of vaccines right let's take the case of a vaccine in the case of a vaccine 95 percent doesn't cut it okay you need to be for sure 99.99 percent accurate okay so this is the p value then the question that you're going to ask me is amit what is the r value what is that all about well the r value i'll tell you what it is i'm just coming to this in a, is how significant is the relationship okay so how significant so we definitely know there is a relationship and we're confident but how significant is this model and we discover that actually it is not very significant while it is true that shipping cost and profit are related to each other it is not true that this is a significant relationship because the r square value is only 0.15 which means only 15 percent think of it that way so if this r squared value had been 0.85 then we could have said that with 85 percent significance we could have said that it is true that profit is being impacted by shipping cost but right now all we can say is that it is true that profit is related to shipping cost we cannot however say that it is true that profit is being impacted only by shipping cost there are other models that we need to create there are other variables like discounts like the location of the customer that we need to explore to understand which one is actually impacting your profits it's not shipping cost okay now what is this called this is called the coefficient of determination and we all need to clap for our friend and thanks a lot for the compliments the best class i've attended all right so please fill in the feedback we need to clap for our friend s kandru 
right? So what's your name, my friend? Yeah. Okay, there we go. So he's actually named the R squared value is called the coefficient of determination. It tells you <clears throat> to what extent Y, to what extent a change in Y is determined by a change in X, okay? And that is the coefficient of determination or the R squared value. Oh God, so you all now know the P value, you know the R squared value, right? R squared value is the coefficient of determination, which tells you how significant the relationship is statistically, while the P value is the error value, which tells you if there's a relationship in the first place or not, all right? So Mohit, I hope you understood, but just to repeat, uh, in very simple terms, the P value tells you very simply, is there a relationship or not? And the R squared value tells you how significant is that relationship, okay? Is it a significant relationship or not? So let me just take that in a different color here. Is it a significant relationship or not? There you go, nice and easy. Are you guys all clear now on this? Good, absolutely. And then there's a lot of, you know, um, advanced things. Oh, the formulas. Yeah, sure. So we're going to show you the formulas um, in this course. Of course, we'll take you through all of this. What? Well, thanks a lot, Dennis. I'm really happy for you. And this year, we've got um, some exports from Tableau, some analysis that we did in today's class. Time for text analytics in R. And R, you can generate clouds like this about Lionel Messi and what what so many people said about the World Cup, right? People were expecting a lot from Messi. Unfortunately, it didn't quite happen. Um, they thought that there's a lot going on with Cristiano Ronaldo. That didn't happen as well. But you all know what happened at the end. Um, there's this really, really exciting player called Mbappe. How many of you have heard of this guy, right? He's 19 or something years old. He's hit a goal already. He's a teenage goal scorer, just like Pele. And this is the word cloud before the World Cup. Look what people had expected and look what turned out, okay? So this was what was expected. We had done this before the World Cup, but the reality after the World Cup, no one here said France, but that's what happened, okay? People are pretty excited. Let's see now um, a live demo in Tableau. So I'm trying to find Palab, our admin. Um, I can't see him. Okay, he's renamed himself called Pallab, not the admin. Okay, so I'm just making Pallab the host now. All right, so he's going to project his screen. We're just going to have a look at R. I'll walk you through R and the R interface. I'm sorry, I just reclaimed the host now. And uh, Pallab, can you please rename yourself admin? Just give me a second here while I'll actually locate my admin. I think there's a lot of Pallabs here. So I've just re re asked him to rename himself as uh, the admin. Just give me a second. Okay, here we go. So please share your screen. I've made you the host. I'm going to walk you through R and we're going to look at the R studio right now. And in the R studio, we're going to look at Trump. Okay, and while we do that, right, we've also got here the flow for the analytics accelerator certification, which starts next Sunday on the 29th of July. I'm super excited. All of you are invited to the first class. However, the discount is valid only till Saturday and we have a 30 day refund policy across the globe in case you have any challenges with this program. It's going to take you through all of the concepts from statistics right from installing R and Tableau Power BI, advanced analytical techniques in R, right? Social media analysis, advanced e-commerce techniques and projects of your choice in HR, banking, marketing, right? Um, uh, big data sets or financial data sets, all of those, right? 
Okay, so that's the program flow. And you can reach me at any time at my email ID or on WhatsApp, and that's available in the presentation as well. But let me share it over here. If you've got questions, just WhatsApp me from wherever you are. And absolutely, BCA freshers can take the course. Many of our freshers have got placed as well, okay? There you go. So Pallab, would you please share your screen now? It's time for a really exciting demo in R. And here we go. We're beaming and we're beaming on um, the word cloud for what people are saying about Trump. And we'll go to the minimum view here so you can see all of these words. Now in this word cloud, you'll notice that the words that are big denote that they've been said a lot of times. So this is basically your frequency. And I'm just writing here the frequency of the number of times that this has been said on Twitter. We are connected right now live to Twitter and we are viewing um, 500, the most recent 500 tweets on Donald Trump, right? Now, this is not very flattering. Okay, so I don't need to say anything here. I'm just going to be silent and people are concerned about something that he said. People are concerned about his interactions with one more leader globally, right? So there's a lot of concerns over there, but let's have a look at the sentiment. What you wonder is of all the things that people said, I'll just pause here very quickly, right? Um, before we go to the sentiment score, I'll walk you guys through the code as well. See what you see here on the sentiments around Trump, okay? This is very interesting. Uh, what you notice is that there are a lot of negative sentiments and these are the negatives here. This is a really high bar, right? This is the highest bar on the Twitter sentiment analysis using natural language processing is negative. You also have a lot of fear. You also have a lot of disgust around what recently has been said. You have a lot of anger. Now you all know what are the comments that have been made recently on social media and it's really concerning sadness. People are surprised on what was said and the trust has gone really, really low um, on account of some recent you know, sort of comments that have been said around this, right? Now let's, let's, let's actually run the same thing in a very short while on Putin. Um, we'll do that and we've actually mined Twitter comments live. All of you will, will be able to do this when you join the course. Let me show you the source code. So we'll go to the source code. You'll notice that we've achieved this with such a small amount of code Okay, now on the top left corner, what you see is the box where you write all the codes, okay? And R, if you've never programmed in your life, don't worry, you can join this course and we will teach you how to program right from the beginning, okay? See, what you need to do is load a lot of different libraries. And this here are all the libraries that you need to load in order to work on R, right? Now. We've got the libraries loaded. So we've got the Twitter library, the word cloud library, the sentiment library. We've got ggplot to draw all the graphs, right? So you load all your libraries. We'll go down a little bit now on the code. After loading the libraries, all of you have the ability to get a free access code to Twitter. We will show you how to do that. In fact, you can learn on our blog. We have a blog on this on our website, equiscale.com. You can get your confidential codes. Now keep going down. Um, then you need to set up your Twitter connection. That's what we've done here. Only one line of code and just copy this code, set up your Twitter connection, extract 1000 tweets from Twitter on Trump. Okay. And we're going to change this to Putin and let's see how that goes. It'll be interesting, isn't it? <laughs> now what we're going to do is we're going to convert these tweets to a vector. Never mind that. And we'll scroll down a little bit on the code. Yeah. Okay, there we go. So what we're doing here is we're also cleaning these tweets. We clean the tweets because we need to remove certain things like smileys. So if someone has put a smiley in a tweet, that's not very useful to analyze, right? Okay, so we need to remove those kind of things or if there are semicolons, for example, or if there are links, for example. So we clean all the data, we remove all of this information till we get to the raw comments that people have sort of created and then we run our codes. Notice that the code is so small, right? Very small. It's not a very long cumbersome code. Our codes are really small, um, easy to do. And that's why uh, we sort of, you know, uh, say that R is so powerful. Okay. 
<laughs> all right so we'll run this you know we're cleaning the tweets and we're running the codes so straight away i'd just like to show you the word cloud and the sentiment around putin very quickly so i think go ahead and please run it for putin let's have a look at these two world leaders okay what do we have here now is this putin here right now uh Pallab, or are we we're still working on it okay that's great in the meanwhile i'm actually going to open up r and show you how easily R sort of works, give you an introduction to R um, in this um, particular class after I take the feedback form. All right, so what I'm going to do in the meanwhile is we're also going to take the feedback form and this is now the word cloud coming up around Putin. There we go. <coughs> you can all see the word cl cloud, right? Again, you also see lie over here as well. Hmm. Okay, yes, you can create clusters of the data. We will be covering all of that in the course, no worries. Let's look at the sentiment cloud around um, Putin. Now, by the way, you also notice cartoon over here as well. So apparently Bennett drew a cartoon. Must be someone called Bennett who drew a cartoon. Um, you see Trump over here, you see America, right? So you see all of these things. You also see the lie over here. Okay, you see stop Trump. Apparently a lot of people want him to stop Trump. Okay, there you go. Let's let's run the um, sentiment on Putin and let's see how it is versus Trump. Wouldn't you guys want to know that? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so let's do that. Let's actually see what the last 1000 tweets on Putin are compared to Trump. And there you go. So that's your sentiment score on Putin. You can see that it's not great either. Okay. Um, definitely there's a lot of negatives there as well. Um, but you know, you can see that the disgust and fear are probably a little lower than our other friend, but both of these world leaders, I think the um, scores are at concerning, right? I would say that at this point, the sentiment that people have on these people is these two leaders is fairly concerning. Okay. Okay, that's great. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, and what I'm going to do is quickly reclaim the host. I request Palab to share the feedback form with you so that all of you can get the video, all of you can get the presentation, right, for today's class. Uh, I'll show you in the meanwhile something really, really easy, right? So I'll show you how easy R is. R is just a scientific calculator. So on the top left corner, I say two plus three, and I run that code using the run button over here and down below I get five right at the bottom of the screen over there right so this is your output and this is your input codes over here right if you assign a value to a variable for example if you say a is equal to five and let me do that now a is equal to five you can actually run that code and you'll notice in the environment it tells you now that you've got a variable called a uh, which has a value assigned to it called five and you can also see is equal to five down below now if you run things like a multiplied by two okay nice and easy you can execute these codes and you can see the answer is actually 10 down below right so i've got 10 over here you can even print stuff nice and easy if you want help on any function on the bottom right corner you've got help and this is known as the r studio okay so the studio is actually really easy it was um, one of the Ivy League universities in the US that actually made the studio. I forget if it was Stanford or Harvard. I'll check and I'll let you guys know. But it's really, really easy, okay, um, to work in the R Studio. And R is going to be our uh, preferred language uh, for this class, right? <clears throat> okay. And Mohit, if you could please share your um, cell number. I think you've got some questions. We can WhatsApp. So my number for WhatsApp for anyone who has specific career questions, okay? Just drop them to me at 9731657840 and just add a 0091 at the beginning or a plus 91 for internationals. Um, there you go. And please drop me your WhatsApp questions. No matter where you are in the world, I'm happy to answer your questions. Now what I, what I need you to do is click on the feedback form. The most important part of this is making this webinar a lot easier for all of you, right? So I would request everyone to fill the feedback form. On this, you'll notice that I've asked you for your email address so I can email you all the information. I've asked for your mobile number. I want to be pretty clear about this. This is 100% confidential. We respect your data privacy, 
right? So please do feel free to share this. We just want to be sure that you're authentic here. Okay, there you go. And you have a free class next time. Okay, so all of you will get one SMS alert for your free class, right? Um, or a WhatsApp alert if you're on WhatsApp. Next Sunday, you've got a free class. Your discount is valid till Saturday. And the class is on next Sunday. Really, really exciting class that we're gonna have all together. Now what I'd like you to do is say done in the chat box once you've filled in your feedback, okay? And just hit the chat box and say done. All right, so <clears throat> admin can tell me how many feedbacks have come in. I'll request our admin pull up to let us know how many feedbacks are in yet. Thanks a lot, Raju, for your feedback. Take your time, guys. What I'm looking to know is um, that, you know, how likely would you be to recommend this class to others? Five is the highest and one is the lowest. And then how satisfied were you with uh, my knowledge and the hands-on exercises that we did and the presentations that you saw today? How satisfied were you? Is there anything else you'd like to see? But then most importantly, how do you think I could make this even better for you next time, right? That's super important to me. Yes, so where is the feedback form is a question I just got. And let me post the feedback form again. There we go. So Timaraju, I've just shared the feedback form with you. Okay, and admin, can you please put it in the chat box how many feedbacks have come in? I'm looking at um, close to 51 feedbacks. We, we've already got 12 of you have already filled the feedback. 20 of you have filled the feedback now. Please just put it in the chat box, admin. Thanks, Tuli. Thanks, uh, Samsung. Twenty six feedbacks in we're halfway there. I'm going to keep quiet while you guys fill the feedback. Okay. Let me just pull up something more and now I'll take your questions after the feedbacks are done. Uh, we make sure everybody's filled in their feedback. So you get the recording the presentation. All right. So I'm going to take your questions in the meanwhile. I'll show you something interesting. So uh, versus Python. Right, there you go. So I'll share this in a very short while. Let's just look at the number of feedbacks in. Thanks a ton, Maria. Um, Corinne, Dennis, thanks a ton. Sierra, Yuluti, Morris, thanks a ton. Dede, Teddy Makasi. All right, so Prasonjo, thank you. Uh, Mega, Anthony, Samsung, Sebastian, Mohit, fantastic. <coughs> There are a ton of jobs. Uh, I'll, I'll start taking the questions now, okay? So um, there are a ton of jobs for PhDs, but unfortunately the misnomer or the misunderstanding is that you need to be a PhD to be a data analyst, absolutely wrong, or that you need to be a PhD to be a data scientist. Again, it's not correct. You might need to be a PhD to get into advanced um, deep learning because there's a lot of mathematics involved, but not, not for anyone else, okay? So today says summer, summer, Ah, thank you so much. Okay. Now <clears throat> the feedbacks are coming in. I'll take more questions. How is the p-value calculated? Okay, there you go. We've got some people here are interested in formulas. I didn't scare the others. Okay, you can just Google for p-value formula. Okay, there you go. <clears throat> and you'll get the formula for the p-value over here. Important thing is that um, this is actually a video here, but I think we can go back and go to the images. Okay, so or if you go to equiskill.com, I think the best thing to do is on our website. Let me just open this here. Um, we've got a tutorial on linear regression. And in the tutorial on linear regression, I think we've talked about the p-value there, right? So free tutorials and introduction to linear regression. Yep.
and you will see uh, in this particular blog the p value right it's mentioned over here in this particular blog so just go through this blog here let me just share the link with you okay and we've got a class on statistics so next week i'm actually taking you guys through all of that okay so just hang around i will take you through the formulas also um, next week morris we're actually done you're absolutely right so i'm just going to share a couple of links with you guys which i think um, will be handy the first is um, again if you've got questions please do feel free to ask me if you'd like to join the course right away we have a 30 day um, refund policy you get access to four months worth of live classes, okay? Which means that you get access to two batches. Even if you miss a class in a batch, you can access to the next batch. This is the global USD $269 link to join the course. Okay, we've got quizzes. We've, we're going to subjectively give you feedback on each and every assignment. And there's going to be close to 10 assignments in this course. You're going to get feedback on each of these assignments, okay? And we've got learners um, across the world who sort of, you know, write back to us asking us for feedback. And the classes are all live, okay? So just like this one today, right? And oh, I'm absolutely open to creating a group. So if anyone wants to be a part of the group, um, you know, please do say yes in the chat box right now. I'll just say group and I'll make sure that I reach out to you. There you go. All right, so I'm getting some comments on the group. All of you who've um, said yes, we will uh, make sure that we add you to a group, right? We'll create a group. Um, maybe you've got, we've got your cell numbers. So do you guys, you guys okay if we create a WhatsApp group? Okay, or would you prefer uh, more like a Facebook group? Okay, people are okay with WhatsApp. Oh, this is fantastic, fantastic. Some people are saying Slack as well, <laughs> okay. Okay, here's what I'll do. You know, I'll just quickly uh, email you guys and check and I'll create a WhatsApp group for all of these people. Um, WhatsApp has 250, 250 limit, yes. And this particular webinar group today is around um, 60 people. So that's great. And Dennis is a management consultant. I think all consultants should know about this, but using the courses are too technical for people on the business side. Absolutely not, Dennis. So we've got a bunch of folks who are business analysts who joined this course, because if you look at it right, Tableau and Power BI, if you, if you just focus on the first part of the course here, right? Tableau, Power BI, this is all hardcore business analytics, right? The second part of the course is where you move into the predictive side and the algorithms, but you'll notice that R is used more by business analysts and data science people on the business side because it does not involve putting things into production or implementing them in the IT systems. R, Dennis is all about downloading and understanding the data, exploring the business data, right? Um, on a static data set is where R is used. Now, let's just talk about some of the topics here. And I think you'll get a drift of what I'm saying. Text mining is used to make sense out of the e-commerce customer feedbacks. Market bas basket analysis is made, is used to sort of recommend new products or upsell or cross sell to customers. Segmentation and clustering is to create your customer segments, right, in a business um, by using algorithms. Linear regression is for forecasting sales and profit. Logistic regression is to figure out if a customer should be given a loan or not any yes or no output, or if an employee is going to resign or not, anything that requires a yes or no answer in a business, right? And all of this here is hardcore business analytics. So I'd say anyone who wants to learn data analytics or data science and apply it in a business scenario, this is great. Um, you should definitely learn this. And as you saw, R Studio, there's no rocket science, right, Dennis? So you've got here um, the R Studio, okay? and. We've got some questions. Uh, how long is the course? Exactly two months. So we will be done in two months flat. Okay. And then you'll have a project which is on credit card analytics. You'll get German credit card data and you need to predict which customer, you know, should get a loan and which customer should not get a loan. Okay. Right. All right. So I'm hoping I'll be able to figure out your cell number um, from your feedback comments. Right, but if you specifically want to join uh, a WhatsApp group, what you could also do is 
I know you've said yes, and I'm hoping I should be able to locate you from your email ID because I don't have the names in the feedback form, unfortunately. But you could feel free to send me a private chat with your cell phone number and your name. Those two things alone. So, for example, um, you could just say, you could click on my name and you could give me your name, for example, Amit, and your cell number, um, and I'll add you. Right? Or I will also check with you for email as well. Right? We'll make a really nice WhatsApp group. So like that, right? Like what I've just sent here. So just send it to me on a private chat. I'll make sure I'll add you to the WhatsApp group. All right, now it's time for the question. So click view. See, Morris, click view is a superb tool. Okay, so I'm not debating. And I think click view, you know, if you look at the pricing, right? Click view pricing is really good. Okay, that's number one. And apart from the pricing, what you'll also notice, and I, I want to talk about some of the strengths of ClickView over here, um, just to be fair to that software. And then just go here. Okay. Um, right, here we go. So what I have noticed about ClickView, and I just want to add is that definitely it is a very good visual analytics tool. Okay. So the visual analytics in ClickView are about as good as Tableau and Power BI, maybe a shade lesser, but I think the you know the pricing is really good and aggressive. The pricing and the licensing, I think those are really good. Uh, they work really well. I think the ETL, it's a mature tool, so extracting um, you know <coughs> data, testing the data, loading the data, as well as the data cleaning, um, those sort of features are quite nice. Tableau is beginning to get there. They've not, they've sort of you know put a new um, package called Tableau Prep. It's called Tableau Prep. But I think Power BI and ClickView are pretty strong in that. The other thing is I think ClickView does a very good job of connecting with all of the cloud um, based databases or other databases and it refreshes really well. So I think what we've noticed is one of the challenges with Tableau is, is the data gets really, really big. Um, and as you have multiple choices in your dashboards that people select, right? The refreshing, you know, in Tableau can become a little bit of a challenge, but I have heard feedback from others that it in click view it's a little better. We're actually working on a medical and pharmaceutical company uh, project right now and they're using click view. So definitely, I mean, that's one more tool um, that, you know, would be great. Okay, so course duration is two months. Can you post the link of your slides here? Yes, so what I will be doing is I'll be emailing all of that to you, right? So I'll email the uh, couple of things, you know, you're recording. I hope you fill the feedback form. I'll email the PowerPoint. Okay, I'll email the data, all of that, right? Okay, so the classes are at the same time, meaning 7.30 p.m. IST. So let me just give you the timings. Next time we're starting on Sunday, just to give you enough time to think about, you know, the course and if you'd like to join, a lot of people join, right? And the discount is valid till Saturday, um, which is the 28th, and you have a refund for 30 days. So 7.30 p.m. IST, if you convert this to ET, that should be around 10 a.m. ET in the US and Canada. And if you convert this to Jakarta time, it should be 9.30 p.m. I'm thinking Jakarta time. Okay, it's 9 p.m. Jakarta time. We'll start from next Sunday. After that, every Saturday and Sunday, we'll have the class, right? So next Sunday is the 29th. And then after that, every Saturday, Sunday, 4th, 5th, 11th, 12th, 18th, 19th, 25th, 26th, um, and then September as well, and we'll wrap up in September. Super exciting, okay? And which day the course is run is on Saturday and Sunday. I'll just put this here, 7.30 p.m. IST, um, which is 10 a.m. ET, Eastern Time in the U.S., um, and I think in London, it's around, I think, 2 p.m. If I'm correct, please correct me if I'm wrong. Right, I'll just check again. So admin can check, right? Palab, uh, 7.30 p.m. IST is what time in London? I think it's 2 p.m., uh, if I'm correct. And in Jakarta, it's uh, 9 p.m., right? And the class duration is around 2.5 hours, right? And we wrap up typically in 2.5 hours. Oh, okay, next class, uh, 2130 WIB Indonesia, okay, right. <clears throat> Is it 9, 21.30 or is it 21.00? So the next class is actually 7.30 p.m. Indian time, which should be 9 p.m. in Jakarta. That ought to be 21.00, not, um, you know, 21.30 hours, right? Okay. And yes, it's 3 p.m. London. Thank you so much. Uh, London and Manchester is 3 p.m. 
there we go yes absolutely so um just for my friend bonnie bonnie uh, the next class is actually 2100 hours indonesia time next sunday okay thanks a ton bonnie terima kasih for joining the class right for all my learners in indonesia all right now let me take questions so sierra um tyson tiwa if you have questions we have learners in nigeria as well so <clears throat> a lot of learners join us I just wanted to spend a minute on how you guys can make yourself sort of, you know, um, popular, right, on the internet as you learn how you can share things as well, right? And this is an important part of analytics and I'll stop recording here for the time being. Thank you everyone for joining the class and um, I'm going to stop the recording at this point in time and continue for those who have questions and queries I really appreciate your time and your joining the webinar today. Um, I have one request though. If you enjoyed the class, please do share your feedback on our Facebook page. Please rate us five. 